David G. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing great. Yeah. I always forget that Thursdays are your uh, you're not at home day. I so. am. Today I am at home. Oh, you yeah, are. I, I I prepared for that. So the cleaning lady came up um, this morning. Nice. She cleaned all the apartments. So I have a clean place to talk to you. <laughs> that, I was gonna really judge you if you did it. So I'm <laughs> glad. I'm glad that you prepared. <laughs> How's your week going? It's going great, actually. I went to the Coldplay concert this Tuesday. Oh my gosh, how was it? It was incredible, yeah. Ugh, I've heard that it feels like like you're on another planet. My friend went and they they released all these kind of like floating objects in the air. And yeah. It was just, it felt like zero gravity for a second. It's really incredible. The It feels like you're in paradise uh, or like to use the name of the song yeah. <laughs> or, it's a, or a different universe again to use another uh, song but it just, just I, the whole experience with the the bracelets mm -hmm. like being on a full stadium and the way that especially Chris Martin he treats people he's like a different kind of person is like a special human being so yeah. really 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 great experience overall that's so cool you're inspiring me we've been debating about going to all the the big tours that are happening this year and i'm just such a homebody you know like once i'm there i'm like this is so cool and i live in nashville obviously it's music city there's so much live music but getting there i'm always like well i could be in bed by eight And, oh my god! Don't do know. that. <laughs> and not, Just the experience. You you're never gonna forget this. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And once I'm there, there I'm never sad that I'm not home in bed. Right. Right. It's just. <laughs> thankfully, I have like a a very fun, spontaneous, music loving boyfriend. Um, nice. He's got you there. Yes. So he's. Uh, I lean on him for that. <laughs> and. Cool. Keep, keeps me fun. Obviously, you've been on the Frontier podcast before. These episodes are focused on a historic event. There is no pressure on you to be a historian or an expert okay. on these topics. I, I thought you invited me because I'm old and I might have <laughs> used this thing. You look at me and said, hey, this guy looks like he he punched was, some cards. Uh, yeah, it was uh, <laughs> building computers in 1964. No. <laughs> um, I, that is not why, but I do think that this is like a fun kind of like random historical fact that you will enjoy talking about with me. So that's why you're here. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Also, this historic event happened three days before my birthday, three days and many decades before my birthday, but, um, Oh, you, you got me scared there for a moment. Yeah. yeah. I thought, is she that old? You're like, drop your skincare routine. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> On April 4th, 1964, IBM launched the System 360 mainframe and architecture. The system was made up of six models of computers that were compatible and interchangeable with 40 different peripherals. So it was dubbed the 360 because it was designed to meet the needs of all types and sizes of customers with one unified software compatible architecture. That's a lot of words. Let's let's figure out what that means. So up to this point, computer systems were not interchangeable, even if they did come from the same company. So that meant that new products rarely worked with old systems, which then meant that companies were reluctant to invest in upgrades since they had already invested in the earlier version. So when IBM developed these new mainframes, they tackled that problem head on by allowing future upgrades to be backwards compatible to all other 360 system mainframes. So at that time, it was considered one of the riskiest business gambles of all time. Wow, we've had a lot of riskier things than that happen since then. So that's, uh, that's interesting. It cost $5 billion to develop, which today would be a little over $45 billion. Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> but it worked out in the end. Thank God. In the first three months alone, IBM received 1.2 billion in orders 
And within five years, they had sold over 33,000 units and popularized the concept of a computer upgrade. Thanks a lot, IBM. It was IBM's most successful product launch ever, and by the mid 80s had generated over 100 billion in revenue. That's what I call a return on investment. Fun fact, the System 360 is also responsible for the worldwide standard of the 8-bit byte. David G, I'm wondering if you can explain the 8-bit byte standard to me, like I'm five years old. Is that something that you know about? You learned this in computer science. Um, and to, up until this point, it, it wasn't defined how the data would look like, right? You could have different type of data structures. And the 8 bit per byte means that you have 8 bits in one byte. And that allows developers to know how they're going to manage their, their memory when they're programming um, software. Mm. And, and you, you can more easily uh, allocate memory for your, for your program. So it's, it's a nice way to define what is the standard and everyone follows that after that so a great great improvement in terms of uh not having to rewrite everything on a different bit byte mm. base again like if you if you're going to six bit byte or uh eight bit byte if different things you had to rewrite everything over and over again so it sounds like this is just like a foundational building block of how we build software today definitely yeah that's cool it, obviously, in 2023, the way we think about updates is a lot different. And even still, I'm always reluctant to hit the yes, update now button because I'm like, you know, my whole life is on the internet. My whole life is on devices. And it's just like inconvenient for me to take a few minutes out of my day to click update. So I'm just imagining before this innovation from IBM, I mean, the friction to update just seems absolutely like insurmountable, right? Like, and I think when you, when you think about the, how, how frequent updates allow us to innovate, it seems impossible for that we could have gotten to where we are today in terms of like rate of innovation without this, right? Without the system 360. Exactly. Exactly. You, it defined a standard architecture that allows uh, programmers and also hardware manufacturers to create things that they know that it's safe to do that and it, you know it's going to work every time. So it's, it's, it's a big change in the in industry, uh, you know, having different models run the same software before you had to rewrite the software all over again. If you need a printer, guess what? You need a printer that works with that mm -hmm. computer. Just you need to create, recreate a printer or it, it introduce the idea that you can insert more memory. So different use cases, different business, you could use more memory. So you have that memory card that you put in there to expand your, your IBM 360. And those are things like you have your cell phone. You, you need more memory. You put more memory in there. But before that, it was nothing like that existed. So it standardized all the, in, the architecture, the interfaces, as I said. So third party could use um, the same thing and create their own product. So it creates huge opportunity on the aftermarket. It set, it set the ground for open standards. So the way that we think about creating software and collaboration and having creating a platform where others can develop on top of that, it really sets the, the standards for that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking this is the example Abby gave us is like, you know, I'm sitting here today, I've got my, my aftermarket monitor in front of me, aftermarket keyboard and mouse. None of them are made of from the same manufacturer, right? I've got my my MacBook Air, that's my machine, but my keyboard is a Microsoft keyboard. I've got a printer that's HP, right? And I can't imagine, I mean, if we put ourselves in the shoes of IBM in 1964, I can't imagine that they were thinking too much about like interoperability between IBM and other manufacturers, right? Like it seems like they were really hamstrung on internal growth 
just with IBM products. Um, and that's kind of the impetus for the, the system 360. But it's interesting because I do think if we could get in a time machine and go back in time and be like, hey, you're actually developing something that's going to allow that's going to open up the competitive landscape pretty exponentially for you. Part of me thinks that they would still do it. Because like you said, developing kind of on top of each other's innovations just increases the rate at which we all win from those innovations, right? Exactly. Those guys were true innovators thinking that way. Imagine the the pressure from the business, right? If you are a business that is striving and you're doing something uh, and you're creating proprietary technology where... Mm -hmm. You have you have your customer locked in to what you do. You see that the, the pressure from the business is do more of this. We need more people locked into into our ecosystem. But this guy's true innovators thinking, no, let's open up. By opening up, you see we'll create more opportunities for business. And and nowadays everyone just follows that. You look at all companies and and everyone's just. Just, just took that idea from that those times and just keep uh, keeps doing that, creating platforms where can others can develop more things. It set the standard for the industry. Even things like the first protocols for mm-hmm. networking, like Ethernet, TCP, IP, they came from things from that time from IBM 360. So it's crazy to think about what one type of machine can do for the whole industry. Right. Yeah, I mean, you talk about risk and obviously a $5 billion investment is like, (laughs) that's crazy. You know, I can't imagine having that kind of pressure to provide return on investment, but also without any sort of um, precedent for what you're building, right? Like I think of it like, I always use this example, but nobody really thought about how bad email sucked until we had Slack. And then it's like, oh, of course, there's a different category for communication. But we, we don't think that way until we have that alternative in front of us. And then the previous world seems like kind of so silly. But I just, you know, I mean, and it's this is true for like any kind of industry shaping innovation. But it's like, man, to, to believe in a vision so much that you're going to invest $5 billion in it when the status quo is working. It could be better but it's working. IBM was still a company. They were creating products. People are buying the products. I, I wish that I had that kind of risk tolerance because I think I would be a very wealthy woman. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, like different different companies had that throughout the time. Some of them didn't do it and just died. Mm-hmm. There's a classic example with Kodak, with the, with the films and photographs. They had that idea for creating digital cameras in house. I think they, yeah, I think they, they had that, but no, the business is for selling films. Yeah. And it's crazy to think about it, right? They let that go. Well, the company, um, pretty much ended and they, and they were winning the whole market share. So it's crazy to think about that. Sometimes you need to disrupt your own business to create new opportunities. Put that on a t-shirt. Sometimes you have to disrupt (laughs) your own business to create new opportunities. That also hits close to home, David G, because I'm from the, basically the town where Kodak was uh, based out of, yeah, Rochester, New York. Cool. But yeah, it's, I mean, you're totally right. It's, it's one of those things where we're kind of giving conflicting stories, right? Like one is stay in your lane, be a market leader you know, just like maintain your lead within that market. And and along those lines of that same story, it's like, well, you know, getting too broad is risky. Um, But I think we've just seen again and again that, you know, the second road, which is no disrupt your own business, be the first, if you've got an idea, someone else is going to have it soon. So, you know, you got to be the first to market. Definitely. Someone else is going to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because I mean, if you, if you were to ask me, hey, Faith, what are the top three most innovated, innovative technology companies today? I probably wouldn't say IBM, but I am grateful for the foundations 
built by IBM, yeah. especially, you know, System 360, as it turns out. They do try. If Back in, I don't know, eight years ago, when I was living in Silicon Valley, IBM was, I think at the time, were really ahead of the time, ahead of their time, talking about a lot about IBM Watson and, mm-hmm. and AI innovation. But I think the routes that they took, like, I think by being at just such a, the way that they're seen as a corporation and how they interact with other business, they, it feels like they don't have the energy to go scrappy like a startup mm-hmm. and, and, and people see them that way that they want to collaborate with that. So people at the time said, yeah, that's cool. That's great. It's great innovation. What you're trying to do with AI here with Watson. But yeah, I'm not a big corporation. I'm, I'm not your customer. But it's crazy to think right. about that. You know, it also makes me think about, I mean, obviously, System 360 changed everything about the way we build software and even how we how we monetize software. Like imagine, imagine being hamstrung by adoption like that still, where it was like, well, you know, we can develop, <laughs> we can develop any, any number of programs, but like we can't. Nobody's going to buy them because adoption is just so full of friction. But it, it kind of reminds me of the transition from waterfall to agile, right? Like it has that same kind of like uh, step change yeah. effect, right? Yeah. Like, and I, I'm curious about your thoughts if we had to force rank those two kind of transitions in technical history. Which do you think had the biggest impact on our, our rate of innovation as an industry? I think for talking for myself because of my career and where it led me to developing software is is my thing. And and I always think that if it hadn't been this way the iterative way how you learn from customers and you iterate upon the new discoveries and and do things again and again and again and always making uh, improvements along the process i i think that wouldn't like my career very much if if it wouldn't if it wasn't this way so i think selfishly for me <laughs> i think this is this is the main thing i, I love Iterating, iterating over its solutions and talking to customers. So yeah, that's that's how I see it. Yeah, I think. and I guess you know, hearing you talk about it, I think the two are actually like we couldn't have agile without the the environment that System Three Hundred and Sixty made room yeah. for. Shout out to whoever was on that team at IBM. We're very thankful for you. Um, we recognize your contributions. <laughs> Thank you. My career would be very different without them. Yeah. Yes. This is also really good to know because I feel like uh, for a lot of these historic events, I'm hesitant to to ask people to be too much of an expert, but I feel like you actually were an expert here. So uh, <laughs> please expect another invite back to the Frontier Podcast. Oh, let me let me talk about experts. I did a little research. Oh, yeah. If we have any companies out there looking for developers who can program mainframes i don't know maybe an ibm 360 if there's one running out there that that it's not in a museum no way we have 26 uh developers in our platform with the portran being one of their skills which is a programming language that you can use with ibm 360 23 with cobalt no way. <laughs> yes. And one person who one of their top skills is uh, assembly, very low level coding um, programming language language. She I talked to her, I interviewed her last last year and she amazing developer. She worked for um, Intel looking for a job with us approved in our platform. So if you were looking for someone that can talk directly to your computer with this crazy set of instructions she's here uh that's incredible um i wonder it would be fun to do a part two of this episode and have somebody kind of walk us through like here's what it actually looks like in practice oh my Um, god i can i can try to get some punching cards and and... (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Great to know. I don't know how any of that works. I did have a teacher, a professor in college that he worked with punching cards. Um, yeah, very, very nice. One of the best professors I've ever had. Shout out to Mr. Salvador. <laughs> hey, Mr. Salvador. Thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> All right, David G, this has been awesome. I feel at least 10% smarter now, as usual, after talking to you. So thank you very much. See you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Frontier Podcast powered by Gun.io. We drop two episodes per week. So if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and come hang out with us again next week and bring all your internet friends. If you have questions or recommendations, just shoot us a Twitter DM at the Frontier Pod and we'll see you next week. Thank you.